Good morning, everybody. Good to have you joining us for our Bible study at Abiding Savior on March the 21st, which happens to be the first full day of spring. Um, we're doing chapter 23 of Matthew. And as we're on that chapter, chapter we see that uh, Jesus has just concluded the discussion with the elders, uh, the leaders of the uh, ruling council uh, in Jerusalem, who were trying to get him to trap and fall into a trap on the Tuesday of Holy Week. Uh, Jesus wraps up that discussion in there uh, with a with this discussion with the Pharisees uh, with a call that they should recognize who he is, that the Messiah is David's son and David's Lord. Uh, his person as true God and true man uh, really should should have led them to believe in him and, and follow him. And it was the end of their their bold attempts to try to get him to fall into a trap because verse 46 says, from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Any questions from you for me? Uh, you can dare to ask me a question uh, from uh, last week's study, anything on chapter 22. All right, so chapter 23 then, obviously comes after chapter 22 and the subject matter follows on that Jesus has some words related to uh, those leaders of the Jewish people. He's going to call them out uh, for their wrongdoing, but these first paragraph is going to be some words specifically to his disciples in relation to how they should act and react to the teachings of the uh, current uh, Jewish uh, synagogues and the Jewish leaders there. It's a little bit of a longer section here, 12 verses. That's just one paragraph. So whoever would like to volunteer for a bit of a longer paragraph, go ahead and raise your hand and I'll, I'll let you go. Stan's looking at Stan, you're the first one to look at me. <laughs> you, you got it. Uh, chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Jesus spoke to the crowd. Phylacteries. All right, so um, Matthew, this paragraph here is a little bit lengthier than the uh, parallel uh, Gospels accounts of Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20. Um, but this whole chapter is going to be a word of, this is the stern Jesus speaking uh, words in relation to uh, his enemies, the people who are teaching false doctrine. But I want you to notice something, that this sternness this, this, uh, that, that he is sharing, it's mixed with grief. Uh, we'll see that come out, especially in a few places, but mingled with grief, we see that these are loving words, even as stern as, as they have to be. Um, as, so, as I said, speaking to the crowds and to his disciples, so he's no longer in a conversation with the religious leaders, the Pharisees, that ruling council, but he's talking about them. And so I have that first question there on the sheet of when or why does he tell his disciples or the crowds? to listen to the Pharisees. See that there in verse uh, verse 3, this is 2 and 3? When or why should, or when and why? You can answer either one of those. When should they listen to the Pharisees? Why should they listen to the Pharisees? Okay.
Okay, yeah. And how do they know what the law says? Now they got the commandments and whose seat are they in? Moses' seat. So this is a, this is a, a position, a place of respect. So they are the authority of, of the Jewish people of the day. They are the ones who, as Moses gave the law at Sinai and the, the word of God, they are in the position to deliver the word of God. Right? So, so listen to them. Right? Listen to the words. How far, though, do you listen to them? Whatever they tell you in accordance with Moses' words, right? If they're going to do things or teach things that contradict the very position they're in, right, that's where you are no longer obeying them. And then don't do as they do because they're, why does that phrase follow it up? Don't do as they do. They aren't following the law. In fact, they would say, we are following the law. They would say, we, we are following the law a whole lot better than these common people are. Now, we wash our hands. The disciples don't wash their hands. Jesus, your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat. So you're, in what way are they not following the law? They're adding more laws to it. They're actually not following the law because they're misusing the obedience of it, right? Rather than seeing that law as a, as a way to show them they can't earn their way to God, they need a savior, they're actually thinking by this law, we'll get to heaven, right? Questions or comments on, on that thought there, verses two and three? Listen to them, but don't do as they do. Uh, the word that comes to mind would probably be they're acting as hypocrites. If you hear another loud muffler go past, someone may want to close that door in the hallway, but it's up to, it's up to you all who are sitting in the back. Uh, any questions there through verse, uh, through verse three? Talk about fathers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's let's get to that verse in just a little bit. So so not, I want yeah, definitely put a pin in that one, Ken. The important question. Um, verses four, and actually before we get to four and following, I want you to think about James chapter three. Uh, that's in in uh, it's blue on the screen. It's it's a the italics uh, font. Anybody care to read that verse? Uh, James three verse one. Yeah, Dave. Apply that, that verse from James to these words Jesus has about the Pharisees. Yeah, Dave? Why are they going to be judged more strictly? They're not following their own teachings or God's teachings that they are sharing, right? Yeah, so, yeah, and so, um, that's a, this is a warning for leaders. For leaders in the church, if you're going to step into position of leadership, watch yourself because there you, there's a position of leadership which uh, presupposes the special additional blessings that you have, the special uh, additional time you're spending in the word. So there is going to be more expected of you, right? Well, that goes with that word of uh, stewardship or management. We are stewards according to what we are given, not according to what we're not given. Faithfulness is desired. So if you're faithful uh, with much, uh, much is, much is, if you're given much, much is expected. So uh, we can think about that as well with uh, leaders today in the church. It's not telling you, oh, no, I don't want to show a young, a young person this verse and discourage them from becoming a, a worker in the church. Or show a new member this and, and show up. Yeah, this verse, there's some reason for you to wait to join the leadership team at the church, sit on the church council. You want to you want to learn a little bit more before you, you take this position of leadership because, because uh, as you are in this position, you're judged more strictly as it were. Okay. Yeah, 
And right, the influence aspect as well. I hadn't mentioned that. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the leaders have have a, an influence over the over those who look to them to sit in Moses' seat or to, to stand behind the pulpit. And any other questions or comments through through uh, that verse? Uh, verses four and five talk about the burdens they place on people. Okay, can you can you tell me? Explain any of those or ask me a question. Well, what are we talking about here with verse four? Heavy loads, placing burdens are hard to carry. We're talking about Friday morning and all those branches, dead branches that I had somebody carry from the workday over to the brush pile. Stan, the uh, tractor came Friday afternoon and picked it all up. So that pile is gone. All right, we're not talking about that kind of burden. What are the burdens we're talking about? Sin, Sin burdens? Okay, in what way? Explain that. Well, uh, we're performing sins. Sin of the Pharisees and Jews. Okay, so yeah, definitely it's hard to carry the burden of sin. Anybody have any other thoughts on uh, these burdens that they place on people? Sue, did I see your hand? If you think you're getting your way to heaven, you have a load you can't manage. Uh, Carol, you have a comment? Similar to what Sue is saying is that <clears throat> it, it, it's depressing rather than uplifting to think that, first of all, thinking you can please God when you can't, and you're totally missing out on the mercy he intends for everyone. Yeah, you think you can earn the way to heaven and, and, and stow the heavy burdens. You're going to get to heaven. You better do this and this and this. And then, well, you got to do extra to make sure. Dave, you had a comment? Was it related to what we just said? Yeah. So more and more laws, but then... They didn't lift a finger to help them. They didn't relieve their, their guilt as they thought, oh, I can't accomplish this. They didn't share the gospel at all, right? That was their problem. The law without the proclamation of, of the gospel. They didn't lift a finger to help. Um, and so those are the burdens we can think of and that they placed on the people. Um, and then along with their hypocrisy about their works, right? What was with their works? They wanted to be seen by the people. Do this. Let everybody see how good they are. What's this with that weird word that Stan pronounced actually pretty well? But I don't use I didn't use it all week in a sentence. Phylacteries. And it's from the Hebrew. Those are the little uh, little pouches, wooden boxes that would be a uh, little piece of parchment with some scripture verses are, are, are included in it. There's actually a footnote if you've got the, the NIV there but especially from deuteronomy 6 8 talks about um talk about these words so with your children when you're out of the house when you're at home when you're on the road um you know let these words be on your your mouth and on your tongue uh, especially shema yisrael adonai eloheinu adonai akad which is um hero israel the lord your god the lord is one that was one of the important verses that they would tie up in a little box and actually put it on their clothing, right? And really not so that they would open the box and pull it out and read it to remember it. Um, they also had little, the special word also for what's on the door frames. They had a place where they put, you got the word for that? Mezuzah, thank you. But the phylacteries are, 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 are right? And on the front, make them really nice and big and long so that people will see, oh, look at that big, long, big, long, I'm not walk away from the camera. Um, this big long phylactery they have, they must be a really, really good guy because that, that Bible verse is really important in their lives. It was, but it was a big show. They, they um, love the place of honor at the feast, right? Because, oh, they, but it was more about, um, more about receiving the honor here on earth than being the leader they, they should lead. Um, you jump to... Uh, before I answer Ken's question that he asked about the name, so maybe I should ask, what's the key to all of these verses, 1 through 12? 
What's the key verse? This is Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus is going to give an example of the key verse on Thursday in Holy Week in the upper room. He is going to. Verse yeah, my, the key for me is verse 11. Uh, Kurt, you want to read it for us? But the greatest among you, but the greatest among you, but the greatest among you will be your servant. The greatest among you will be your servant. And what was the event I was referring to? Jesus washed his disciples' feet, right? That's service. What's, what's true leadership in Christ's church? Not being authoritative and having, ha having the, the dictatorial powers to enact great things and accomplishments and being known by all for, for your authority and power. Uh, the greatest is the one with a servant-like attitude. So it's really what these Pharisees should have done rather than focus on all of these burdens that people have to, have to do and follow relieving those, serving them, helping them carry, helping them carry, not, not the show of, uh, of authority or show of power or show of closeness to God, but the show of actually loving and caring for others. That's what uh, they should have had. So then we get to verses seven and following, and we have these names, right? It says, don't use the word rabbi. What's the word rabbi mean? Teacher, my teacher, right? Uh, and no, don't call him father. Right? Don't be called leader. Oh my. What's the best title for you to use for, you, for your pastor? Pastor? What? And you see, Jesus is using all these different titles. Have I ever uh, described the, the church council or even uh, and me included in the leaders of this church and used the term leader? The bulletin this Wednesday, when we have a guest worship leader, a councilman, a staff minister, a retired staff minister, Mark Probst, is going to lead the service. Um, so the responsive readings, where it usually says pastor, in the bulletin, it will say leader. Oh, no. Mistake 452 of me for the year. Because verse 10, you're not supposed to call him leader. No, no. What, what are we saying? This will get, get to, to Ken's question. What is this about not saying the word rabbi or father or leader? What's wrong with it? Who? Yeah. Ego is involved. Yeah. And so they're looking for these positions to elevate their place of authority and, and finding their sense of who they are. In the title, Jackie. Okay, Reverend. Should you call your pastor Reverend? Yeah. Now you were wrong, Jackie. You shouldn't have done that. No, I'm sorry. No, it, to me, it meant respect. Yeah, it meant respect. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nothing wrong with it today. Did you ever in grade school call your teacher teacher? Teacher? I hope so. <laughs> Any of you teachers and had someone call you teacher? All right. Well, okay, sorry. I guess you just broke what verse? All right. No, the, the, the point is that, that the Pharisees misuse these titles because they used it for their egos, their arrogance to be a position that that uh, held them up as closer to God. And so what about the person who says, the leaders in the church shouldn't use any name, shouldn't, shouldn't be given any name, name uh, shouldn't be given any title because their egos are going to get in the way. Just, just, just use their, their first name, their given name, just like, a, just like anybody else. We don't want to inflate their egos. They have exactly the same problem because their egos are going to get, because of the way that we are referring to our leaders, we are better than the people who are calling them these titles. So it's all in the manner of the way it's used. Ken. I was just thinking of like, we call our, our Lord, Landlord, President, you know, it's like yeah. that. Titles have yeah, meanings, titles. and titles have meanings and with function. Right. Um, 
Reverend can be used to, for a pastor because you're, you're, you're revering, there's respect for the position that proclaims God's word. Not so much the person, but the message that's proclaimed. Pastor is, can be used because it's, uh, it's a name that, uh, that shows that this person has the care of a shepherd who is going to be leading us to times in life when we need it, right? Um, I'm going to talk in my sermon about the word priest. You see, that word, that's not my function today. I am not offering sacrifices. Don't need to use that word priest. Right? I don't use the word rabbi. because People would think I was Jewish, but I don't mind being called a teacher, which is a translation of it. If someone speaks to me, as someone who comes to play soccer on the soccer field, and they see that I'm a coming over for church uh, on Wednesday evening, and they're actually finished up with church on Wednesday evening, and they're about to play a little bit on the soccer field, and someone says, Padre, good to see you. Well, I say, no, don't call me Padre. <laughs> so uh, I'll recognize it as a, as a sign of respect, but I'm not going to let it inflate my ego. I'll say, okay, they are, the, you know, Paul was, uh, was a spiritual father for Timothy, and pastors can be viewed in that way as well. I avoid, I avoid asking for that title. So any, any questions or comments? It comes to the attitude uh, with which this whole situation presents. I always yeah. thought, you know, growing up, Jesus and Jesus was about to be the next one. Next one. Hey, Seuss, yeah. Yeah, they call it Jesus. And then in your sermon on Wednesday, you talk about Jesus the rabbi. Yeah, that's the and that, that, that was his yeah name. Jesus Barabbas. That's actually the NIV 1980 uh, 2011, and I, I mistakenly used that translation because and I didn't actually see it until the sermon. I actually was reading that text, uh, it, for the, and so they kind of caught up on me. And I was going to look at it this week to see what the Greek says. Uh, the EHV just has Barabbas because yeah, to, to include it in there, it is it is a little confusing. Uh, Jesus was a common name of the day. A Barabbas, Bar is the word um, uh, for, uh, not, no, Ben is the word for son. What's, I forget what Bar what bar means from the Hebrew. But uh, so anyway, I, I'd have to look at that a little bit more. But, uh, but yeah, it was a common name. A lot of people were named Jesus or Joshua in, in that day. Uh, yeah, but yeah. We don't, even whatever name you have, you, you, don't, you, you don't take it to whatever title you have, don't use it as a way to lord it over people. Jesus had talked a little bit about that earlier when the disciples had the discussion about who's the greatest. Uh, so what are you going to call me? Don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> you can call me pastor. Yeah. What about words like slave, servant? Uh, the words like slave and, and servant, um, it's actually what literally the word minister means is servant. So, um, so yeah, minister may be a good, a good name uh, to be called minister. The prime minister of Britain is, isn't the big awesome leader. He's actually the chief <laughs> servant of the public, chief public servant. Um, so that's what elected officials, uh, you know, in, in, our, in our system, they should be public servants. Um, yeah, the name of the word or title slave uh, comes, brings with it a whole lot of social context and connotation that uh, probably don't want to actually call somebody that. Um, but uh, we might call ourselves that because it's biblically accurate to say we are either slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. There's no middle ground. So with that explanation, it's not wrong to describe ourselves. <laughs> Harriet, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone's in the chat. Uh, sorry. Uh, so honor your father. Yes, we would continue to honor the your father and mother, um, and we by referring to them with an honorable names and ways, and, and using the word father is fine. But again, the whole attitude with which we receive it, should not elevate our egos. 
but elevate the position of, all right, I need to serve uh, the responsibility of a father. And, and, and there is one father in heaven, and yet God has granted individuals to be people who represent him here on earth, the government and, and in the home, the, the parents, the grandparents. Yeah, uh, anything else uh, about that? Um, a couple of notes from the chat box. The additional laws given by the Pharisees were unnecessary burden. Um, okay, bar uh, means son, so okay. Yeah, Ben is also son, so uh, bar is an, uh, also means that. Uh, John, help me out. Anything else from uh, these first 12 verses? Kurt, please. I, I have a question. So why, why did the tax call their priest father sometimes? Why, why do why padre or father, why is that used? Um, because it's that position. It, that position of honor and respect. Uh, and, and recognizing that the that their their priest is in is supposed to be in theory that caring role, so yeah, so that, that's why you know if, if someone calls me a priest, I I would pretty quickly explain away that no, I'm, I'm not a priest. I don't offer the sacrifices. I'm not the go-between, but I I don't uh, I don't correct someone who might refer to me as padre or father. Okay. Anything else there? Right. Yeah, and so individually, how each individual priest or padre might receive that name will be up to the individual. But yeah, the caution is there. Ken said, does the person who's called by that title think they're closer to God because of the title? And then also, do the people who uh, who you know, who um, who use that word for somebody else, do they think that that person's closer to God because of the title they have? It all, it all goes to understanding it correctly. I don't mean to be. What about Pharisees? They were kind of a, a level. Yeah, so, yeah, I wouldn't want to be called a Pharisee because it, it means that, in effect, they, they were hypocrites by and large. And yet Jesus said, listen to them as long as they're teaching the word of God because they're on the ruling council. So it. You don't take all of these laws as additional birds. Don't use this name. Don't use this name. Jesus, with his, with his words and his teachings, he gets to the heart of the matter. What's your heart saying? What's your relationship to God? What's your purpose? Elevating yourself or service to others? That's the whole key here, right? The greatest among you will be your servant, verse 11. And then the application, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will, will be exalted. One of the commentaries I read, especially with verse 12, talk, I think of it must have might have been another church father, but I think it was Augustine. Augustine said something as far as if you try to exalt yourself up to reach God, you'll never get there. But if you humble yourself, God comes down to you. Another way of paraphrasing there, for verse 12. I think there's a hand in the back. Uh, yeah, Dave, please. Yeah, tone of voice, definitely a big aspect here for, for teachers or leaders in the church to consider uh, how, how that all applies. Um, definitely. All right, anything else in these first 12 verses? All right, now we're going to get into the woes. All right, we're going to move from here. Jesus had spoken words to the disciples. 
Now he's going to have words of woe and they will be addressed, especially to the Pharisees. One of the other things you note here, remember there were two groups on that ruling council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus doesn't mention the Sadducees at all in this section. Because the Sadducees, as they denied the resurrection, they were no longer sitting in Moses' seat. Jesus does not even honor them by calling them out with these woes. He's just speaking to the Pharisees, who at least were still people of the book for a while, even though they, and so they would hear these words as, as again, a call to repentance. This is not judgment already upon them. This is, judgment is coming, so repent. We'll have all of these. Uh, a parallel account, Luke 11, uh, seven woes. A uh, number of Bibles have it titled that way. Um, the first woe is actually put together in the paragraph. Uh, it's just verse 13. Does someone care to read the first woe? Uh, Ken, could you read verse 13 there? Woe to you, teachers of the law of Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's face. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying. All right, so, and then look, the first word here is the word but, right? That means, uh, right, the, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Who, uh, yeah, okay, this is some good words. Jesus gospel, humble yourself, be exalted. And now, but, we're going a different, different direction. This is people who are not doing that, are not going to be exalted. What does the word woe mean? Not what you say to your horse. <laughs> woe. Bad stuff's coming your way, right? Anybody have a better definition than that? You can look up Google a dictionary definition of what woe is, but yeah, bad stuff's coming your way in effect. Um, why are they, well, they're hypocrites, but not only are they themselves suffering, are they themselves hypocrites and woe's coming because of their personal teaching, what's the result of leaders who are hypocrites? The people who follow them also suffer, right? Uh, who follow in their mistakes. So in effect, what do they do? They shut the kingdom of heaven right in front of people. Not only did they say, we're not going to follow Jesus. They discouraged people from following Jesus. They tried to stop people from believing him. That's why their public testing was going on earlier that same Tuesday. So that's in effect, discourage people from following the Messiah. You'll notice that the EHV goes from verse 13 to 15, but there's a little footnote in there, all right? Because verse uh, 14 in many Bibles is equal to Mark chapter 12, verse 40. Uh, a par parallel thoughts uh, describing the, the Pharisees. Uh, you devour, devour widows' houses is part of that phrase. All right, so they, you know, going after the weak and, and, uh, and, and whatnot. But why the footnote in the NIV just says, in the EHV says, many early witnesses to the text omit verse 14, okay, because it appears that whoever cop with some of the copyists, it's not a widespread verse included among many of the manuscripts in different places. Uh, it seems like a, a scribe was going and said, oh, yeah, this is where he talks about the widows and devouring widows' houses. So he inserted it, maybe originally as a footnote, maybe between the lines. And then over time, it was added. But that happens sometimes in the copyist in certain places. But don't worry. It is clear in Mark 12 and Luke 20 that that sentence that uh, is not found here in verse 14 <laughs> because it was taken out. It is clear that's still scriptural. Whether or not you agree with the editors and you don't have that verse or you have it in, uh, it, this is one of their, their accusations that they've devoured of widow houses. Did someone look that up? Dave, you're looking that up. You want to read for me whatever, whichever reference you have? Tell me which reference you have. Uh, NIV. NIV, and you have Mark 12? Yes. Mark 12, verse 40. Go ahead and read it for us. They devour widows' houses and for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Yeah, yeah. so their punishment has come. That, that basically is that first woe leading people away from God. And any questions on that? Or any more questions on variance? 
Um, the next woe, just one verse, verse 15. Someone care to volunteer to read that? Okay. Woe to you, experts in the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel the sea and the land to make one convert, and then when he is converted, you make him twice as much one as hell as you are. Hypocrites again. <laughs> What is the what's the issue? What are they doing here? Converted, they go through lengths and efforts to get people to follow them and be converted, but then after they're converted, they're twice as much a son of hell. Hmm? Anybody want to explain that to me? They lead them astray, and then they're twice as much because they wind up being convinced that their error is correct right so a convert who is told let me show you the way to earn heaven and they follow these pharisees earning the way to heaven following the laws you can do it and then they're certain they can follow the laws well enough to make god happy and they're absolutely positive we're doing it why are they twice as much a son of hell because now they're certain in their self-righteousness and I'm uh, not going to listen to other correction or be brought to repentance. So that's why the twice as much, um, because they're, they're, they're basically strengthened in their wrong direction. Questions or comments on, on that second of the woes? All right, the next woes get a little bit longer. So uh, someone care to read uh, verses 16 to, to 22? Nobody, oh, Celia, go ahead. So what's this about O's? It's a pretty complicated system, it appears. I'm going to swear by the temple, and that's going to be like having my fingers crossed behind my back. Because I can do that, and then my promise doesn't mean anything because I'm forgiven by the cross. Right? So I can tell a lie and be forgiven. Huh. I can tell a lie if I'm, if I'm making an oath on the temple, but if I swear on the gold in the temple, which is really valuable, then it's an oath that has to be kept. All right, what do we see here? We have, we have a complicated system of religion, especially in the area of oaths here. And what did it do? It made the people dependent on the leaders. What's the kind of oath that I can swear? And eh, maybe, maybe uh, eh, not quite do it all the way. What, what's the kind of oath that I better not break? So this complicated system made the people depend on them, um, but they were blind guides because they're inventing Inventing things, inventing answers to questions that really didn't even need to be questions in the first place. Um, so it, you probably better at times when uh, when the pastor does or the leader in a Bible study does say, you know what, I'm not sure the Bible tells us that answer, <laughs> rather than inventing your own answer. Okay? That's a blind guide who just makes something up. So we need to talk about. Anybody want to give me a definition? Of what is swearing? Taking an oath, right? and and swear would actually be an oath verified in the name of a higher power or higher being, which is what we're talking talking about here. The, the higher power of the temple or the gold in the temple. Um, what's the highest power by which we do swear? God, true God. Swear taking an oath in Jesus' name or in God's name. When's that appropriate? When may it be appropriate or would it be appropriate to swear an oath in court? And I've generalized it by saying in a matter of importance. 
that you need to verify publicly what you're saying. In general, you, you let your yes be yes and your no, no. But if it's going to be a public thing, if you're going to do something legally and sign an affidavit or have a notary there who's legalizing the signature on the document, uh, it's a matter of importance for legal reasons. Yeah, in such a situation, an, an oath, uh, swearing in God's name would, would be appropriate. But you want the people around you to know you've sworn by the highest thing that, that you respect. Um, but you recognize what you're doing when you swear by whatever it is. And don't swear by the hair of your chinny chin chin like the three little pigs, right? You don't have to swear by your whiskers. I don't know if my whiskers can do anything. Ken's maybe can. <laughs> but yeah, so, so yeah, we, you, we don't need to verify an oath by the name of any other little thing. It's not important. Just let your yes be yes. But in a matter of importance, then, then you, we can publicly uh, use God's name, God to verify our oath. And the Pharisees were all blind, you know, an intricate system that basically led people away. I was just going to comment on some of the words that you use. British use bloody. British swear words. Um, yeah, and, and swear words. If you want to be strict about it, there are curse words that call down pain or bad things on a person. There is swearing, which we just talked about. And then there's vulgarities, all right? Bloody would probably be a vulgarity and not, well, in general, we call them all cussing and swearing, right? But if you want to be specific, cursing, swearing, vulgarities, stay away from the ones you need to stay away from. Need I say more? But I'll answer questions if you have them, if I can. I'm not going to invent answers. All right, uh, move on to the next woe. I guess we're up to the woe number four, a, a little bit shorter here in verse 23. Carol, you've been, uh, you know, I'll let you uh, read for us if you would like. Okay. Woe to you, experts in the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give 10% of your mint dill and cumin but you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice mercy and faith you should have done these things and not failed to do the other things blind guides you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel so what's going on with the pharisees what are they doing 10 percent of their mint and dill and cumin have ever you have those mint in your garden you have the little leaves can you picture, or, or the dill, the little pieces of dill? Count out nine of those and give one to one to God. Count out nine mint leaves and give the tenth one to God. Ten percent. We're going to do it. With, we're going to do that if if uh, if a little volunteer comes up in the garden and produces a little bit of a little bit of a fruit there. Right? A little bit of spice comes up, and I'm going to make sure I give God ten percent. Right? They're following the law in its fullest. What was the problem? So focused on that specific action of what's the specific 10% in the minutia, that they forgot the big picture. Justice, they forgot mercy, they forgot faith in the savior. So they, they ignored, ignored that. Um, it, you know, taking out that 10%, uh, a modern example, should I give? my percentage to church based on my gross or on my taxable income? I've heard that question from time to time. Good question, fine to ask it. And I say, everything belongs to God. What you give back to him, give back joyfully. You make the decision. I'm not gonna give that answer. I'm not gonna tell you what percentage. I'll say there's some guides, but uh, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to, uh, you recognize you don't have to give any of it to earn your way to heaven. It's all a gift of thanks to God. And so you're going to think about that when you, you with everything you get, should I give a 10% of the, uh, of the, uh, the IRS stimulus I'm getting here or just God? Give to God what you joyfully want to give. See, there's always a need in the church. Give, give joyfully from the heart. 
All right, any, anything else uh, from that uh, about uh, that, that matters of importance to the law and faith and justice? Uh, okay, they didn't talk anything about the blind guides, verse 24, strain out a nap, but swallow a camel. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with camels? Uh, they were the largest of the unclean animals. It's actually a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big slam here. Picture that straining out the gnats so that they don't come through the when drinking water doesn't get the gnats to swallow. But ooh, the biggest unclean animal that you should be able to avoid that goes right down. You know, missing the big picture of faith in the Messiah. Any, so, any questions about that fourth woe, especially related to the tithing? Carol, please. <laughs> I just made me think of, of the almost the reverse of that when Jesus was talking to the young rich man. He was telling the rich man, give it all away. And and that, you know, that's kind of like another example of this. Everything we have is a gift of God to begin with. It's all his. And so it is truly just the condition of your heart and a matter of faith as to how you give. Yep, that command to give everything away, uh, it really got to the heart of the matter that he said, no, this doesn't belong to God, this belongs to me. I'm not gonna, let, I'm not gonna use it for God's will. So it was a preaching of the law and, and coveting was the sin that Jesus uncovered. So yeah, the matters of the heart. Uh, that's why when we talk about how much to give to church, it's always the gospel motivation. You know, or, or Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You have that verse? And you say, God, how, how can I use my riches for you? Um, all right, let's go to the next woe. It's the fifth woe, verses 25 and 26. Someone care to read here? Yeah, David? Woe to you, experts in the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of a cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish so that the outside may become clean too. So Jesus is, is calling them out for their, the way that they are focusing on the ceremonial washing, washing the, the utensils and things, even cleaning the outside of, of the cups and the dishes. He's really taking that picture for people, right? Washing the outside of the person. So you appear to be so holy and good in all of your actions, but the heart is pride, proud and thinking it's earning something from God. We're talking about a person creating me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. When that happens through faith in Jesus, what happens to the action of these imperfect hands? Move to serve God. And so the hands become new hands, an entire new body in, in service of the Lord, even though it's imperfect. I guess in my notes, I said they're blind because they didn't recognize original sin. They're unable to keep the law, which is the whole point of the law. You can't keep it. You can't earn your way to heaven. So what they worked so strenuously to fulfill, it was only a caricature of God's law. Right? Those ceremonies, cleaning, they didn't really... Um, didn't really do anything to approach God. And none of it cleansed their heart. Questions or comments uh, on this? Yeah, Ken. I, I just want to comment on it. I looked up the word woe in the Bible. It calls it the Greek word to be used. Pride. Pride to you. Okay. I, I cried. Use the actual word. Pride. Okay, cry it out to you. Yeah, cry, cry out in a loud voice. This is, yeah, this is a, a loud thing about the difficulty they're in. So let's read the sixth woe then. Thank you for that. Uh, someone care to read the next paragraph, uh, verses 27 and 28, after you flip your page over? Yeah, Dean, please. Woe to you, hypocrites, first clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self indulgence. You are unrighteous, clean. So 
this is really similar to that same point about the ceremonial washings of the inside of the vessel, uh, identifying the original sin and how do the hearts get made new. Uh, whitewashed tombs, they're called here. And Numbers 19, uh, it just talks about to touch the grave. Uh, any grave would make a person unclean for a week. So what the Jewish people did as the Passover approach, they really want, you don't want to be unclean for the Passover because then you're going to miss out on the big holiday and the special meal. So they would, in leading up to the Passover, they would go with whitewash and whitewash all the tombs. So you stayed away from the whitewashed rocks in that time around Passover because you didn't want to be unclean. And so this is the Passover, right? Passover week. Can picture all of the graves were whitewashed, uh, sparkling white around Jerusalem. This hit home. Stay away from that. Okay? And the Pharisees, because of their outward appearance, they looked all holy and clean, but they were sinful at their heart because they did not repent. Questions or comments uh, on that? Yes, Sue, please. Um, yeah, no, it's not really that they were, they were leaders on the council, but the experts in the law were the, were the copyists in part. And because they were the ones who copied it, they did know it better. They, they, so two different positions or classes on, in, in the leadership. So yeah, so in that terminology, not, not a slam per se on the, on the Pharisees. The slam would have been not mentioning the Sadducees at all. Uh, verse 29, that, that paragraph, so 29 to 33, will be the seventh woe. Hopefully we can get at least through number seven. Celia, look at me so. All right, so this woe, this is the insincere honor they give to the, the Old Testament prophets. Um, many of the Old Testament prophets did die a martyr's death. Um, but God saw through the show of honor, as my notes say, the show of honor that these Pharisees put on for neighbors to see. Um, they were arrogant and condescending view of the past. It often accompanies a re remembrance of martyrs. Let's bring that to home. I'll bring that to modern day. To live today and say, if I had been around the time of, of Washington and Jefferson and Madison, I never would have allowed the Constitution to permit slavery to continue. Can you honestly really say that, 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 that you could put yourself back there in that time and, and you're judging them in, in, in that way? We're going to recognize the, the problems of slavery, yes. Um, and yet, you can also recognize that that time period is it's not a time period. My time period today is to live where I am, and I'm not Washington or Jefferson, and I'm not going to dishonor or disrespect them and the accomplishments that God allowed to happen through them, even in spite of their, their weaknesses and their problems. Um, we look back on the past and we say, I wouldn't have made the mistakes my father's made. Well, what are they showing by saying that? Really showing a lack of their own repentance from their own hearts. Um, full, the full measure of the fathers, the whole judgment's coming. Now, who did, though, receive the full measure of the judgment of the fathers? All of the sins of the fathers. Who were they placed on? Jesus. You serpents, you offspring of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? What was the answer? The answer was staring them in the face. How will you escape hell? Jesus, the one talking to you. So see how see how even this this these woes, and then and it's filled with grief, crying out. Filled with grief, you know, want, repent, 
how many believe? So uh, I, I want to play up uh, the next paragraph. Rosie, would you do you mind reading here verses 34 to 36? Oh, I gave you a couple of difficult names. If you pause, I'll read them for you. Good. So we have finished the woes and now look, right? These are called to re repentance. It was met by hostility that not just Jesus, right? The bloodshed wouldn't stop with Jesus, even though he accomplished salvation. The people Jesus send would, sent would, would also be met with hostility, starting with Stephen, the first martyr uh, killed by, by Saul. Uh, but um, some of them crucify, uh, they were met by that hostility, and it's going to continue on. And it's going to be just like your fathers had the first murder, Abraham, until the last one. The, the, the Hebrew Bible was divided into uh, three sections. So the first section started with Genesis and ended with Second Chronicles, which is why, um, which is why we have that listed here. It's actually the first book of their first book of the Bible, first section of the Bible, and the last book. And there were murders in both of them, right? Abel, you know that one, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's uh, son. There, Abel was killed by Cain, um, and that. Uh, that, that bloodshed was righteous. Zechariah was a prophet, son of Berechiah, and, and he was killed even in the before the altar there in the book of Second Chronicles, uh, as, as he was calling the people to repentance and telling them that uh, that Jerusalem would fall and be carried off into captivity. All these things will come upon this generation. Come to repentance. Okay. I think there, falling on this generation, I think of the Jewish people who heard him. What did they say to Pilate? It's in my notes there. His blood be on us and on our children. All of this judgment would fall on them, and they themselves willingly received it a couple of days later. But this generation, the people living in Jesus' day, which one person can we see that actually received the full burden of all of these things? as a substitute, right? Just like Jesus was the answer in verse 33, who will rescue you? Jesus is the one who received all of those punishments in the place of the people. So again, we, we see Jesus grief here, but also calls to repentance, identifying himself. Uh, we're gonna take two extra minutes and I'm gonna read verses 37 to 39. Um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house has left you desolate, for I tell you, you will certainly not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, this cry to Jerusalem, 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 his grief is in full view, isn't it? God wants Jerusalem to be his bride. He courts her. And, and one commentary writer, it's actually the People's Bible, comes out and says, we see Jesus' love here, and it is not lust. He loves his church. He's courting the church. He's wooing the church to be his bride, and he wants to be with her. But Jesus will not force himself on people. He will... Be with those who receive him by faith. He will not force himself. He will not force people into his church. So that's him calling people to repent. Uh, and so his reluctance to resort to coercion, um, when his seeking love is rebuffed, that's not a weakness. Some people, oh, he, he, he can't accomplish that. He can't win, win this individual over to him. That's well, not a weakness on his part, really. Um, it's the true power and wisdom of God. And he's not forcing people into his kingdom. He's using the power of the Holy Spirit. And then notice how this, this woe-filled, this law-filled, this judgment-filled sermon, it ends with gospel hope. 
from Psalm 118 that's quoted here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They had heard it two days ago, Palm Sunday. When would they hear it again? When would they force, be forced, even unbelievers be forced to acknowledge the blessing of Jesus? <laughs> Judgment day, right? Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And everybody, believer and non-believer alike, of course, at that day, um, we want to be on the side where it's a blessing and not, and not done. So I kind of went quickly over that. Um, if anybody has any quick questions, we can do that or else uh, wait until next Sunday to bring anything up. Thank you for letting me go a little extra. We'll, we'll close with a blessing. Of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. That recording stopped, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Carol and John. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a great day and a good week. You're welcome. Yes. That's about Good Friday. Friday. It's not the first, right? It's the, Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon is spread. You should write a letter to the editor and correct, correct Professor Brown. You don't have many opportunities to do that.